Uh, I make that time to go. So let's, let's kickstart this session. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, I'm Dan, Key Account Manager for CYP Europe and uh, the UK. Um, with me is Kevin Cray, our Technical Product Development Director. And <laughs> we're going to do our usual uh, session, so we'll run through some bits. We can uh, ask, well, if you've got any questions, please just pop them in the chat. Uh, the chat function is available to all of us. And if we've got any time at the end, then we might be able to do a little question and answer session. So today's session, again, thanks for joining us. We're going to be covering is, uh, installation essentials. So that's things like testing products and such like. So let's kickstart the session now. If you're not familiar with CYP, we're mostly known for signal management and signal distribution. And that would include things like our AV over IP products, HDMI and HD based D matrices. Uh, we have a huge range of extenders to fit all different sorts of applications. Audio products like converters and amplifiers, uh, switches, converters like scalers and such, signal management tools, some of which we'll look at today, uh, HDMI cables, and these can of course be used across a very wide range of applications. So today's topics, we're going to look at the XA3P and the XA4, which are some of our testing and analysis products. We're going to look at some different types of HDMI cabling. We're going to look at then our RE range, which we sort of call our get out of jail range. And then some non HD based T products in our in our PU series, which will be some audio and control over cat. And then looking at our racks series, which can integrate a lot of CYP products, but can also use other products as well. So let's start with test products. I'll give a bit of an overview. Any other points you want to add, Kev, of course, do. I know that you and the tech team use these all the time. Yeah. We'll start here. This is the XA3P, which is our portable uh, handheld signal generator, analyzer, and cable tester. Uh, you can't really, you'll see us a few more pictures in a moment, but that is literally, it's probably only maybe sort of six to seven inches tall. Uh, so as I say, very easy to hold, just a handheld device. It is battery powered. So obviously this can then just be taken about on site. It's charged just with the USB cable that comes with the unit. So it's very simple to keep charged and then just use it on site. We put on here, of course, it does then support full 18 gigabits per second, 6G. Uh, so again, that can be used for either pattern generating, signal analyzing, or you can test cables as well with it up to uh, 6G, 18 gigabits per second. Built-in downscaler. Again, any of these points, Kev, if you want to go into detail, I'll just sort of cover. Oh, well, I've just seen you've got it. Fantastic. <laughs> In that case, I'll just put some points up, Kev. Do you want to have a, just a quick run yeah, through? Yeah, I mean, there? Uh, essentially, it's a, a, a reasonably standard 4K 6G pattern generator and analyzer. So it has various pattern modes and various timings that you can output. Uh, but really, its general use is for that type of thing. So when you're when you're building a system, you might want to use it as a pattern generator before you before you have sources available to check your the cable runs and everything like that. But also, it can be analysing at the other end. So if you, you you have sources but you don't have TVs up, you can use the analyzer mode to make sure you're getting signal and signal lock, and it can tell you more information about that. Obviously, it can go into some EDID. Uh, configuration and um, analysis as well not full uh, not block data analysis but enough to give you enough to go on and then of course it has the HDMI um, cable testing mode which is for 6G HDMI cables now there is a really good point it does say this in the manual but I'm going to make the point anyway this is an incredibly difficult thing to do um, we actually make a box which is like a big rack mount box that we, we don't sell um, because we only sell them to cable manufacturers. Um, so they're not a general thing you'll see on our website or anything. But this, this box, box costs a lot of money. You know, you're talking thousands and thousands of pounds. And all it does is test HDMI cabling. That's all it's designed to do. It's like a, a four-way HDMI cabling system. Um, but it's used by an awful lot of HDMI cable manufacturers around the world to do their, to do their QCing before cable runs go out. Um, so whilst we have it on this unit, while we were developing, we had to go through various uh, various types and modes and see what worked best. 
So we've ended up putting it in quite a strict mode. The idea behind this is that, that if you have a, uh, a non HDMI 4K cable, it will always fail because it's on strict. But because it's on this strict mode, it will occasionally, when you're using a, a 4K cable that's perfectly fine, it will occasionally fail it. So what we recommend you do, and as I say, it doesn't mention this in the in, in, in the in the in the manual. You can set the test up for 30 seconds or a minute or two minutes. So the test is not really, really long. Um, but what we recommend is if you get a fail, try it two or three times. Because it because it's in this really strict mode, which was the only way we could guarantee that if it wasn't a 4K cable, you would always get a uh, a failed result, which is what we were after here. So do test it a couple of times, a couple of three times, uh, 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 either a faulty cable or a non 4K cable that's not full 4K 64, 4.4 or 4K HDR compatible. That will always fail. So just note that, and again, just because this is an incredibly complicated thing to do with such a small um, unit, as you can see from my hands, it's not very big, and I am, I am, I've got massive hands. I'm, I'm anti-Trump. I'm massive-handed person. So it's, it's a really small, small device. So yeah, so it's got the, it's got that function as well, which is incredibly useful. Um, so you can just literally just run cable output, to cable input, put it on um, cable testing mode set the time and hit hit go it will do the standard um data set analysis first so we'll check the the you know edid exchanges and htcp and, and things like this before it then uh, and hot plug as well before it then runs a test for the amount of time that you've set it for so it's incredibly useful you couple that with the ability to just react as a pattern generating when you need a source or an analyzer when you haven't got a screen, so you can check the signal is valid and working fine. Then it's an incredibly useful tool for for all installers, and really, they're not super expensive. And I would thoroughly recommend that uh, if you're an installation installer, an integrator, you have this in your armory to be able to use. And if you're a distributor, you should be encouraging your your integrators and your installers to carry them. They're only a few hundred pounds. They will repay you many 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 times over and on that note of carrying it about just highlighted there they every single unit does come with the case you see on the top right hand side of the screen there so that will obviously hold the xa3p which is the one that kev was just talking about and there is then a slot on the right which would hold its bigger brother the xa4 if you don't have an XA4, of course, you can use that space to maybe hold some HDMI cables or some other bits in that case. Um, just to note on there, you can see the amount of output resolutions and output patterns. If you're looking at 23 and 11, uh, just bear that in mind when we get to the bigger brother, which then has sort of more, it's just to give you an idea of the comparison between them, really. Just looking at where this might be used, Kev's kind of gone through it really perfectly, um, but you do get an idea here. So again, for an installer or integrator using it on site, uh, source and sync testing, of course, it's just bringing up a few points here, but it really is useful for that sort of on-site use. Just let that run through there as well. And then in a second, we'll look at how the screen is actually displayed. Obviously Kev did show one there, but we've got just a couple of examples of the screen layout. So it's incredibly simple. You can see there in analyzer mode, and it's just literally using the up and down buttons on the front of the unit, and then you've got the enter key as well. So it's quite clearly laid out. Pattern mode, and then cable test mode. So again, really simple to use with that on the uh, the on-screen display there. And you're just flicking through there, you just flick through the task modes, and it just flicks through the analyzer pattern and cable test modes. Super, fantastic. So let's move on then. This is the XA4. So this is physically larger uh, and it is then, it's not, not a battery powered unit. It does uh, run by five volt input, I believe. And then this is, as I say, the bigger brother really. Uh, this is what all of our engineers tend to use for bench testing. Yeah, there we go, fantastic. Thank you, Kev. Turn it on, it's not plugged in, it's not battery powered. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> the proof is there. It doesn't have a cable plugged in, so it does yeah, not power up. Like but you can see power it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> on this unit, of course, again, if you were using it then for bench testing, it does have a lot more physical buttons available to it. So there'll be less sort of going through some of the menus to get to some of the options because it has more direct buttons available to it. Those are backlit again, as you can see there. 
Let's just carry on scrolling through. Like I mentioned earlier, the XA3P, the portable unit, had 23 and 11 of the different types of test patterns. You can see here, this one then does have a significant amount more. So again, for more thorough testing, it does have more resolution settings, more test patterns, uh, more analysis tests as well. Quite a nice function where you can, <clears throat> you can upload a picture to use as a pattern. So if you make like a 4K picture, like a logo of your company or something like that, you can actually upload that and use that as your test pattern. So when you're, when you're testing on site and stuff like that, you're testing with your, with your company logo, which is quite a nice little function. Very good, yeah. Uh, and another thing, just from the bottom left there, you can see this does then have VGA and HDMI, whereas the smaller one is HDMI only. And then this one also has the separate audio. So uh, is that for output and input, Kev, or just output testing? Uh, it's got an input as well if you want to, if you can switch it to the, uh, the analogue input, um, overriding the HDMI if you're on HDMI or if you're using it, um, for for testing an audio source that's coming in and you want to check that's going through to the HDMI you can do that as well you can set that up with the audio with the audio settings on it as well fantastic and it, oh, yeah I mean this is where it, the, well there's a few there's a few major differences but as you see on the side there you've got a um, an RJ45 LAN port for control uh, which allows you to connect it to a network and use a piece of software called Anapat which allowed you to manipulate uh, and set different runs. So you could set it to, to, to flick through timings. You know, so if you're doing, like I would do a, a product test, I can set it just to, to flick through all the, however many different timings there were, 80, 70, 60, whatever there were, and it will just roll through each one uh, for you automatically. You can also do EDID input and output and use that through Anapat as well. Uh, so it's a lot more flexible and you've got the RS-232 there as well. So you've got a lot of more flexibility on that side of it as well. Obviously it's, uh, it is a much bigger uh, a unit. It, it does do a lot more analysis. Um, you can get full, um, you can look at the full data blocks for EDID and things like this. But where it's incredibly useful is if, <clears throat> if you need to test a particular timing so you really want to test um 4k 420 60 hertz 10 bit you can do that because it's got the ability to change not only the resolution and the refresh rate but the color space and the color depth as well so if for example you wanted to check um some some variants of hdr to see what will work for example uh, most of us know that 4K24, 420, no, 422, 10-bit HDR is just within HD base D bandwidth, just under nine gigs per second. Um, but it's not a very common uh, HDR output that many devices will, will output. So it's not, I, I don't even think it's a Visa standard. It certainly wasn't when I last checked 18 months ago. But this has the ability to set up all those different bits of the overall timing. So you can test it you know that your this box is going to do x this source is going to do y this one you can test your system in a really accurate way uh, and it's got much more analysis from the uh, from the point of view of the edid data and the hdcp data as well so you can look at those checksums uh, you can even look at things like the the, the key selection vectors on, a, on an hdcp signal so in other words how many devices can hang off a box uh, so if you don't know what a key selection vector is, that's how many, basically how many individual TVs, endpoints, sync points, that a single HDMI source can be connected to before it stops outputting. Um, so there, it is a lot more thorough. There's a lot more you can do with it. Um, it, it is, you know, some of the some of the functionality within it, even we don't use very often, you know, like the, the EDID checksum functionality is, is great. If, you've, if you think you've got a, a, a fault with the EDID that's based in a screen, for example, you can yank the EDID from the screen, get it up on your screen, get the block data up and look at the checksum and go, oh, that's wrong. The EDID in that screen is corrupted. Go and find one, download, make one, and then overwrite it. Um, so it is a lot more, it's a lot flexible and it's got a lot more functionality. Again, it's one of those things that depends, depends where you are. Whether you need this or not really depends where you are in that, in that 
echelon of, of, of how complex and how big your systems get. I know a lot of um, re uh, commercial installers do have them because they have a lot of big systems that they're building and they find in having an XA3P and an XA4, especially with a nice little box, is a perfect solution to be able to, to test anything anywhere in any system because you can use one for the pattern generator, one for the analyzer, you can check your edicts, you can check your all your HTCP settings, you can check the whole system data is correct and there's nothing wrong and you're not getting any distortions or, 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 or minor interference in the system. So they are more expensive, but they do do a lot more. Again, um, some people, uh, they're probably too much, as in they do more than you need and they are quite expensive i think they're more like 1500 or something like that they are quite expensive but being um the uh sort of new product director we use them all the time uh for for new product development and for testing within our rma process as well so within our rma process we we basically have two of these that act as a as a source and an analyzer uh, in any system so as well as testing anything in in the way that a user says it might have had a problem with we can test it we can run through different timings and test it very easily with with these xa4s as well wonderful it seems really silly saying this now as well after all those really technical features but am i right that the backlight on the buttons actually changes color depending on whether you're in analyzer or um pattern mode is that right so again yeah, you does, know yeah. what you're doing at a glance yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. Again, yeah. just simple things like that for when you're using it. I've noticed that with you guys in the tech department, that depending on the mode, the colours change. So instantly, yeah, you I mean, know whether it, that's running. It, it, it's got some some things that make it easy as well. Like if you press and hold the timing button, it will put it in bypass mode. So you know sometimes you want you don't want when you're using it as an analyzer, you might be going up to a screen and analysing it before the screen just to check signal integrity. At that point, you don't really want the scalar active. Um, but that's an important feature for both of these that that even in analyzer mode they they can they can still output so they can still send the signal on and that signal can be uh scaled can be changed so you can you can check that in that way as well so it's incredibly useful i mean it really you could do a whole hour session on these and bring up anapat and, and all the functionalities that it, that it does but but really it, it is just that if you need something that's more than the XA3P that has more flexibility, has more ability to set your timings up to exactly what you want to test with, then the XA4 is the way to go. Wonderful. Good stuff. I'll just quickly run through a couple of these other bits. There we are. Gives you a bit of an idea of how you can use this in and out. You can see it there being uh, an example with headphones for monitoring some audio. Yeah, uh, as we, we said, that. HDMI and video. Useful. Yeah. So again, yeah, just more versatile if you are needing that for a slightly more advanced uh, testing or system analysis. Another little device in the XA range then is the surge protector. Uh, many of us are lucky enough to not have too many issues with this, but we are aware some regions or some locations may have issues here and there with power, sort of unstable uh, power. So to protect some devices, you might well consider the XA HSP, which is the surge protector unit. Uh, and it's literally just designed to take the brunt of something like an electrical spike. Um, so these are available as part of our XA range. Again, just another way to try and uh, enhance or protect some of the equipment in the system. Let's have a look at HDMI cabling. So as Kev mentioned earlier, these we're very stringent about. Obviously the cables need to do exactly what they say. And that's why these are all incredibly well tested. Um, so we're looking first here at the CYP premium certified HDMI cables. So these are certified, uh, officially certified by the HDMI group um, to basically cover full 4K content up to 18 gigabits per second. Uh, there's a lot of spec there that we won't go through, but obviously you can see it covers all of those main points that you would need them to cover. But key things with these is actually then the quality of the build, uh, which we'll look at as well in a second. But you might notice on these premiums, and we will actually cover it as well in a second on another cable, traditional HDMI cables would have the normal fold on the back here uh, where the, where the cable where the where the, the cover has been wrapped around the HDMI head these models don't have that and that's the same with one of our next cables as well to basically increase the quality of the connection absolutely it, it makes the connection the connection a lot better uh, you can imagine as you 
as a machine folds a piece of metal around a recently machine soldered um or worse hand soldered but machine soldered device that's that the solder is probably just going off you do run the risk of 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 some of those um pins suddenly connecting to what is essentially the the earthing sheath around the outside wonderful and as we've shown on the bottom left there, every single premium certified cable would come with this sort of sticker with the QR code. So again, that is just certification that it does meet those requirements. Yeah, that, that's very 4K. important as well, isn't it? There's a new one coming out as well for Ultra. So the uh, the, the 2.1 that they're working on at the moment as well. Yeah, and, and it, is, it is kind of important because um, anybody can make a claim about a cable. Um, and, you know, it, what's very common is you know you might get a cable manufacturer and they get a a cable that's been certified at one or two meters and then they attempt to certify attempt to promote that without the use of this logo because they haven't got them certified for longer distances and they apply that logic and say oh well you know the two meter pass the the twenty five thousand meter one is bound to pass well no it's not you know so really when you when you get these you should be able to scan that uh, obviously it's a little qr code you should be able to scan it and it should tell you all the information it will even tell you what meterage that that's for so i've even seen that you've got a situation where you, you you get hold of it you scan it in a shop and you've got a five meter cable and it's telling you it's a two meter cable well that's just naughty <laughs> frankly um so all of them should have this and you know it's it's easy to make a claim that something does something but having it officially certified by the HDMI organization that it is certified to do that, to do to pass those resolutions, to pass those timings is obviously incredibly important. Indeed, definitely so. And these models here, the premiums we do from half a meter, uh, one meter, two meter, three meter, five meter and seven meter. So basically half a meter up to seven. And then above that, we go on to a different cable, which we'll look at in a second. Yeah, and all of those are all of those are certified as well. So, uh, you know, as we've gone through this process, um, originally we got up to five meters certified, uh, and then we um, upped the uh, American wire gauge and did some alterations to the to the to try and get seven meters certified as well. And we we got that certified very well. So all of those are certified correctly. Exactly right. And this image here shows you a much better representation of what we were describing there. So this is the head of our premium HDMI cable that we just looked at, which again is a, a zinc die cast. So it's one piece without the normal metal stamping, as it's showing here, without the normal uh, join between. So again, that's one of the bigger steps up with these premium cables to ensure a better connection. Yeah, and it does really help with that interference right at the end of the, the, the cable. So, you know, you can get a lot of you can get interference down the physical cable obviously you can but also you know that it's the ends of the cable that are close to the the piece of electronics device that's powered so actually um you know having that that die casting die cast end and it's not folded like that will will really improve that that e direct emi from sources and, and sinks as well sources and tvs as well fantastic so let's move on. This is one of my favourites, which sounds really sad because it's an HDMI cable, but our AOC, so an active optical cable. So these come in 10 and 20 metre versions. And again, if you can just gauge that size on the left hand side there, I think Kev's normally got one in his, uh, in his, in his shed there, in his um, workshop, should I say. And yes. it is an incredibly small HDMI like organized head. Organised tools. Organized That's tools. it. That's it. Yeah, I'll let yes. Kev uh, show you there in, in real life the so, size um, of that HDMI head. These are, th there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a point I want to make there. So these are, again, um, incredibly small. So, again, massive thumbs that I've got there. Look at that. Uh, and they're really, really small. I still can't find my bit of cheesing down. <laughs> I, I, I tidied up my workroom, everybody, and I had this lovely bit of, you know, like um, the conduit that you put in, a, put in a wall and plaster over it, and you get different sizes of it. Well, there's a real small one that's really, really small, and this drops straight down through it because the head is so small. The bend radius on these is really excellent. I mean, you know, it, it really is very, very good. It's, you know, I've had this one. This is the original sample we were supplied many years ago, and I've been using it 
ever since that for must be three or four years at least. It still works absolutely fine. It's a, it's a beautiful cable um, with the, the die cast head on it as well. So not folded in, made, you know, considering you've got the optical driver and receiver in this head, it's an incredible piece of engineering. Uh, they're really, you know, as, as Dan says, it, it sounds a bit odd, but from a, uh, a technical point of view, these are just stunningly good cables. I mean, I, I went through testing processes for optical cables over many years and, and we never sold one because the ones that we were being sent by random companies uh, that wanted us to sell them were, were, were nowhere near good enough. They were unreliable. They are powered or had stupid little heads. And this is, a, this is, this, the, this is one that, that's made um, in Taiwan where, a lot of our, where, where all of our equipment is made. Uh, and so it, it, they made this, I don't know, I think, I think they said it was over a million dollars to create this machinery uh, to make these new heads and then to make it to, so it connect to optical cables and optical drivers. So these are incredibly great. They're really, really small, 10 and 20 meters. They are incredibly reliable. They're absolutely excellent. Ah, one thing to note while we're talking about these is that the cable testing mode on an XA3P will not work with optical cabling because it's relying on voltage signals being sent down the, uh, the cable that are non-standard. And so the optical transmitters and receivers in these don't know what to do with it. So it won't work for that, I'm afraid. But yes, those are these are really, really great cables. They are, are very easy to install, fantastic bend radius, fantastic reliability, and just really, really beautifully made. Totally agree. And I know it sounds strange as well, but when you actually plug this into an HDMI socket, it has a incredibly uh, robust connection, doesn't it? It, yeah. it properly fits in there incredibly solidly. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, but we have done the, uh, the, the, the holding test where you basically yeah. plug in something <laughs> to the cable and then hang the cable and it will hold it so securely. Again, I wouldn't recommend that to the public. Yeah, but, uh, yeah don't, don't swing it about though. <laughs> exactly, yeah, <laughs> we yeah. We yeah. used to do that with SCART cables. There used to be a SCART cable that had a little, had, you know, that had the dips in it. I don't know if anybody remembers what SCART cable is. And there used to be ones that really used to push in and hold mm. in and we used to do a little uh, SCART switching product. And we should because <laughs> <laughs> they locked in. It was designed to lock it in place. Wow. Crash helmets on and away with your test, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, and just to note, I think you did mention it, Kev, but to be aware, these are specifically marked as TV and source. Oh, no, I didn't. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. So the heads do very clearly say one is source and one is TV. So just make sure they are connected in the right way around. Yes. This is actually uh, a brand new product. We've just thrown this in because it was designed, this product here on screen was designed exactly for that cable, for that AOC cable. Yeah, so I mean, a, you can use it with normal cables as well, but the point being is that um, we were developing it for meeting spaces where it's just got an HDMI output this, and we wanted to make sure uh, that it worked with these optical cables that we sell. So when we started the design, we started it uh, with this in mind. So we knew what voltage it had to put out to make sure that, that, that it could keep the consistent five volt back to the sources and still have enough five volt left to ensure that the fiber drivers on either end of the cable were still powered correctly. So, yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. So that's really it. Yeah. As you say, that's exactly what it's designed for. So for a simple solution where you need a tabletop switching unit and then up to 20 meters distance to your screen or projector, whatever it's going to, this is exactly what it was designed for. So, so again, it's just a using... three-way three -way switcher. It's got, a, it's got an auto functionality, so it will auto switch. On the back of it there, you've got uh, an HDMI output on the right hand side. In the middle is an RS-232 mini jack connector. Obviously, it comes with a little cable for that. Uh, so if you want to integrate this tabletop unit into a wider control system, you can. And then you've got the power on the left. So this comes as a kit with the unit already sat inside its little tabletop housing. Obviously, you get some clamps or some feet for it. Both come with the unit as well. Um, so those are literally just come just come into stock now. Exactly right. So, yeah, that one is just another solution. Again, just using those AOC cables. Let's have a look then. We do have as well the Ultra Slim. Uh, so again, just from looking on screen there, you'll probably see straight away, they are incredibly small HDMI heads again. 
uh, with a nice slim profile cable as well. So these, whilst as you can see there, they have, uh, you can run 4K through them, but they haven't gone through that same premium certification process. And these go up to three meters at the moment. Uh, and that would be yeah, from 0.5 meter up to three meter. Just a look here again at the importance of the wiring. We won't go too much into this, but again, a lot of it is based on the, the short distance, for example, of where the cable comes from the main cable out into the connectors, that short distance there to reduce any EMI. Also then the incredibly high precision soldering that's done on our cables as well. And as we said then for the higher two ranges there, you've got the zinc die cast head as opposed to the traditional style. So again, all of so that, that is that die cast head isn't isn't fully seated yet, by the way, as well. It, it would it would go down to, to, to meet the pins. That's there. right. That would That's cover just, down it, to it's here. It's an expanded view, if you like. But you can see That's the it. difference. I mean, literally, that cable on the right was uh, a cheap cable that, that someone bought that we took apart. And you just look at the state of it. I mean, it looks like it I put not, it together. It was not, you know, it was not a high grade cable. We weren't expecting it to 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 be amazing. But we opened it up and went, oh, my God, it's, that's a real mess. <laughs> and thought, well, that'll be a good example of what an HDMI cable <laughs> shouldn't look like inside. <laughs> there we go. And here we are, just a little bit more information again. You can see that there, really, the precision of these cables to put them together. Again, that's incredibly important to reduce the interference. And again, that does then help in this case with the small, HDMI, even our premium cables, which has the largest HDMI head, that is still quite discreet. It is still nice and small. There's, there's always been this little bit of debate about HDMI cables as well. Sort of the, the logic going, well, it's only carrying ones and zeros so it doesn't matter right well it's not that's not true i mean it is true that it's carrying ones and zeros but this okay on the screen here i might be digital but sitting in my room here i'm, I'm analog the cable lives in an analog world it doesn't live in it all right it, it, before it comes out of the source it might you know it might be digital as soon as it hits your cable it's it's not a digital signal anymore it's an analog signal. It, it is basically a volt, a square wave for up being one and down being zero. So if you get interference of cable skew and that starts turning into a sine wave, then all you need is one square wave bit here where it's supposed to be reading one to have been circled round a little bit so it's just down here. And suddenly what should have been read as a one has been read as a zero. And then if that's if that part of your HDCP checksum, bang, no picture. So yes, you know, traditionally for when HDMI started, we could get away with a lot of a lot of cheap and not very nice HDMI cables. But certainly, once you get up to 4K, it's incredibly, uh, you know, it, it's not uncommon for there to be issues with the cabling. And you know, you have situations where people go, "Oh well, the, the cable's fine. I've just got it out of the bag. It's brand new." Well, change it oh look it works because you know things don't go wrong so you know be aware that it's it's it is a lot you should be a lot more fussy with your hdmi cables now than you were sort of five ten years ago because it really can make a lot of difference in a 4k system you've only got so much different distance you can manage with hdmi cables you know so it's really important to get really good quality ones so if you're going in and out of an amplifier up to a projector or, or even up to just a TV, you know, all of that cable distance has to be taken into account, you know, and you, you're talking about maybe having 10 meters, you know, 4K, 6G from, from source all the way through whatever is going on to your sink, to your projector or TV. So, you know, if, you, if, you, if you've got problems with HDMI cabling or they're not very well made, then suddenly you're going to find that if you try and go to that kind of distance, you, it isn't going to work. And you're going to get dropouts or even worse, no picture at all. Well, actually, dropouts are worse than no picture. At least with no picture, you know it's not going to work. So, you know, you plug it all in, you leave the site, 10 minutes later, someone phones you and they haven't got a picture or it's dropping in and out. So a lot of this can be, you know, just it's just budget HDMI cabling. So, you know, do pay attention to it because it is important. Cool. And if in doubt, test it with an XA3P. Aye. <laughs> Repetitively.
Yes, exactly, exactly. Right, I think we've covered that now. That is fine. So we've had a look again. You can see there the precision of the yeah. Paper. So those, are, these, these, as you saw from these ones, they they are folded, but they're pre-folded. They're not folded on top of the HDMI cable. They're pre-folded. But as Dan says, these are designed to be incredibly small and and in, uh, incredibly small heads. So they're not quite the same quality as the Ultra Sims. Are not quite the same quality, but they're still they're still from the the same manufacturing. Um, Tyree's manufacturing partner. So they're very good. Wonderful. Well, let's have a look. We're sort of halfway through, so I hope everyone is still with us. Thanks again. Uh, let's have a look. So we're going to look at some of our RE range. Uh, I'll probably let Kev cover these because I've I've looked at them, I've read the specs, but you've probably used them as well. So we go on to the uh, EDID 4K22. Yeah, so this is an EDID manager. So it's got presets EDIDs, it's got user EDIDs, it can pull an EDID down from a screen and save it. It can even upload and replace the EDID that's already on a screen. So if you think you've got a corrupted EDID uh, on a screen, uh, with a normal EDID manager, you'd have to leave it there because the screen's corrupted, uh, which, you know, is not very common but you know in the 20 years i've been doing this i must have seen it well i've seen it over 10 times where you've got a, the edid within the screen has just become corrupted so with a normal edid manager you you'd have to leave the edid manager there with this you can make the choice to overwrite the edid actually physically on the screen now this it doesn't present any problems but there is a uh, a point to make it which is if you ever send that screen back for repair, the manufacturer of that screen could complain that the edit, their edit's been rewritten over and it could cause problems. Never had it happened, but I know that it, it, it's a possibility. So it has that ability to do that as well. So you've got read, write and emulate. So the emulate is using its internal edits and its user edits that you can set and you can save and you can upload to. And then it's got a read mode, so it can read the edit from the screen or the source. And it's got a write mode where it can overwrite those modes. What's also quite useful about this product as well, and this is why it's also another great product for integrators to have in their van, <coughs> is it's got 4K to 1080p scaling built on. So it's actually a really cheap budget scaler as well. So we actually have these used where people just want to um, take a signal and, and manage the edit and drop the signal to 1080p. Uh, so it can do that for you as well. It's got a little bit of HTCP management in there as well, and it's full 18 gig in and out, in and out. So very, very versatile, very useful device. Wonderful. Just quickly, Kev, what's the interface? Is it on-screen display, or is there another way to access those settings you've mentioned? Uh, it's, yeah, it's an OSD, yeah. Cool. You, Excellent. Uh, there is a way, um, you, yeah, for advanced users, you can use like a, uh, you, you can connect it to a, a a PC and put it in a in a, a USB mode if you like. I can't remember what buttons you said. It's it's on the it's on the menu and you scroll through. And that way you can use it with our advanced um, discovery app. And within the advanced discovery app we do, it's got like an EDID management section that relates to this and a few other products. So you can see and upload and store EDIDs that are common. Say you've got a bunch of you know, you, you, you've got a bunch of TVs and what you'd like to do is you usually use an LG OLED and a Samsung QLED. Those are your two TVs you use. So if you're using all the same range, range and they're the same panels, even if they're different sizes, they'll have the same edit in them. So what's sometimes useful is to get on that and drag those edits off those screens. So if you ever have a problem with an individual screen, just put this on put this in between for a quick test put it on user one which is lg put it between the lg and see if it makes a difference find out if there's a problem with the edit in the system because remember with edit you're going um the source is requesting the information sending it all the way through your system no matter how big it is all the way up to the tv unless something interrupts it in the in the in the on the way through and responds earlier and then it's coming all the way back so another useful trick here is if you think you've got an edid problem are you getting data interference down the cabling infra infrastructure. So you can go source edit manager. That's my HDMI cable. That's fine. I can see that's fine. Right. Well, it's not that HDMI cable. Okay. So now, now it goes into a matrix. 
So I can go, right, let's take an HDMI out of a matrix. If it's got an HDMI or an HD base T, connect it at that end. Check the EDIT. Use the EDIT. Is there, is there a problem? No, there's not. Or yes, there is. Oh, look, we've got interference. So you can use it at different stages along the EDID or along the, the cabling chain to see where a problem might be in a system as far as EDIT is concerned. Brilliant. No, that's great. That's the sort of thing that will probably help a lot of people out, isn't it, with that sort of information on yeah, where I to mean, test again, it and things. You know, yeah. It's one of these things that they're not super expensive. You know, I know that having, you know, too many expensive tools, you know, is not always possible. But some of these things are not that expensive and they really will pay you back. All you need is to do is to solve one problem on one site and it's more than pay for itself. Good stuff, good stuff. And just to highlight there, the model number of this unit, the RE EDID 4K22, that does imply, as you know, then that it's uh, got 4K HDCP 2.2 support. Not that we've included it in this presentation, but there is a standard RE EDID, which is then just a 1080p based model. So slightly Yeah, it's basic. exactly the same, really. A Fantastic. slightly different format. Uh, but yeah, it's just not 4K22. So it's for older systems. Again, still selling a lot. While we were last year, we still sell, probably sold more of those because these type of EDID managers are more commercial uh, installers. I mean, I, 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 some of the installation partners we have in, in Germany, um, they literally put an EDIT manager before every screens in systems. So that they, they, they just, it's not worth having a problem. They put one in before every screen, it, which is, you know, it works, it works. And they, they don't have problems. They never have an EDIT problem. Excellent. No, nope, good stuff. Good stuff indeed. Oh, there we go. Oh, you've actually covered all of that. Just the information on screen now. I think you've covered all of those features anyway, which yeah. is good. Yeah. So yeah, fantastic. We shall carry on through. Uh, oh, the RE101. Would you like to have a quick go on this one as well, Kev? <laughs> yeah. So th th this is just a cable extender essentially. I mean, we've we've looked at uh, uh, ways of doing this and. If you're trying to, yeah, just run through them, Dan, just get them all. Yeah, super, if you're, it's if going, you're, yeah. If you've got to the point, <clears throat> excuse me, where you've got cabling that you know is working, so it passed the test, but you're still getting intermittent problems, maybe you're, you know, and it works, you put everything on 1080p, never have a problem. As soon as you switch to that, 4k hdr source or whatever you're getting dropout or inter intermittence or you're getting a problem now and again hot plug detect does sometimes you can switch to it and you don't get a picture that'll be hot plug detect <laughs> and so this little power device is just a way of, of repairing the, the the hdmi cable signal from the input to the output so it accepts the signal it, you know, it already knows what a good HDMI signal should be, what the voltage level should be for the TMDS channels and everything else, you know, what the five volts should be. And it, it literally takes it apart, puts it all back to what should be perfect, and then kicks it back out again. Fantastic. So normally these, um, uh, uh, these, these are just used on that type of environment where you, you've, you've gone too far or you need to go a little bit further with an HDMI cable. Sometimes if you can't replace that cable, uh, then this will help you get out, get out of jail. Fantastic. Good stuff. Uh, this is a slightly older one that's passive, but it's only 1080p. Again, um, we did look at doing a 4K one here, but trying to get the same kind of 10, even 10 meters in and out just doesn't really work with 4k 6g you just it just you still struggle um so we've got the active one for that and then really if you're planning an installation and you you want to go that far then look at the look at the uh the the hdmi optical cables as a solution fantastic yeah you're right i suppose actually a lot of these were designed before we had things like aoc weren't they so of course they were designed yeah. to help you with traditional hdmi cables but now we have things like aoc as well yeah, but these could be retrofitted and things like that. So still they're, a viable. They're option. very useful if you've got something buried in the wall and you just want to, mm. you know, and you and you want to add length to the system. You mm. Bang, bang, bang. There you go. You've suddenly got it from that side of the room, another three meters over there, or or whatever. And 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 they're very useful for that. As is as is the one hundred and one before. Fantastic. 
and yeah just a bit of an example of it there you can see just as kev said input and output just allowing you that additional uh, length when required Right, let's have a look now at a few uh, audio options that are in our PU range. So as many of you probably know, PU in the beginning of these model numbers was originally based around the word Puma, as in a cat, because these were devices that would carry a signal over cat cable. So PU range, traditionally you'll have probably seen these with uh, video extenders, as in video and audio, uh, like an HD based T extender but we've covered that in another session. So today we're looking at some audio over CAT, which would then be models like, we'll start from the top there. You've got the PU304 kit, which is a simple point to point audio kit, uh, digital audio in, digital audio out the other end. And this will transmit up to 150 meters over CAT cable. Um, one of your favorites in there, Kevin, is that the one that you use at some point? No, I've got the PU305 BDAs, uh, but it's good. the same something. Sort of the, the reason I, I use them i mean these are all proprietary data so they're all our own system of, of carrying audio from one to the other the 304 is the oldest one which was a development from six seven years ago and that's just very very useful at just getting those optical signals around but can only be used with itself whereas the 305s these could be mixed and matched um so for a start their input and output so they're sending audio one way and back again um, they also have an RS232 bus as well, which is quite useful. And they can be mixed and matched. So you can have the, the digital one at one end and the analog one at the other end. To, so you can input analog and output analog at one side and then go input digital and output digital on the other side. So they're bi-directional, it's going both ways. They also come uh, with one power supply. I think from memory, the TX box has a power supply in it. The RX box doesn't but you can power it either end. So it doesn't matter whether you power the TX end or the RX end, you only have to power one end. And they're incredibly useful if you're trying to send uh, audio in two directions. So I always use the example because I'm using one at home. I've got a DJ mixer, some DJ decks and things like that because that's, that's, that's sort of fun of a weekend for me. And this sends uh, an audio signal from a DJ mixer all the way back into this very room here to a audio matrixing system I have here. So that allows me to send whatever I'm playing on my decks on my DJ system, in the garden, in the bathroom, in my bedroom, anywhere I like. Um, but also I want to send from my mixer back to my DJ station, so that if I'm if the the kids are streaming from Apple Music or whatever it is they use, they can just choose a zone, and it, I can get it to come out either from my audio matrix or I can insert it into my my DJ rig with my lovely lovely KRK speakers. Mm, nice, very good. But yeah, very they're good. very very versatile. You know, they they're, they're just good. You know, they just work. I've had this one installed for, for I don't know how many years, two or three years probably. I don't think I've ever unplugged it. <laughs> it just sits there, does its thing, works, runs down a cat cable. It's very, very reliable. Never had to even unplug it. It's great. Love it. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. And just to, uh, obviously our model numbers sometimes are quite long, but they do make sense. So you'll see here the models that we had highlighted at the top are the 305 BDTX, which is a bi-directional transmitter, and then BDRX, which is then the bi-directional receiver. And then the analog versions just literally add the letter A in there. So bi-directional analog receiver, bi-directional analog transmitter. So again, they do then make sense with the digital version or the analog version. Uh, you can actually use some of these with some of our PUV matrices as well. And in fact, a few other products. So if yeah, you've got one of our, five, yeah. yeah, that's it. If you've got one of our uh, HD based T matrices that's got the CAT audio outputs, then exactly as Kev explained, this can be used to send audio from your matrix to somewhere, or it can receive audio from somewhere remotely back to the matrix. And, and that can, yeah. Exactly, just adding to that flexibility. Um, so this can so that, be that's really great when you got a, when you're using one of some of our bigger PUV matrices, and you've got like uh, I don't know who what what we're having these big resident. Oh, you've got a pool, you've got a pool room, and you just want to you just want to send audio to the pool room from the system because our bigger PUV matrices have a whole audio matrixing section that's designed for audio only sources, whether it's Sonos or DAB players or or I mean I I use 
old airport expresses. So I've got airport expresses. Look. <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go. They create zones in my house. So yeah, any of you can walk in my house, uh, go onto my Wi-Fi and stream from your phone to my system. So they're very, very useful. So you can you can bring the audio back or you can send it across that way. And, you know, it's just very, very, very useful having that extra functionality when you want to go from a remote source with, with, a, with a larger one of these matrices. Fantastic. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, that's just an example there of the 304 kit, which we said is the shorter distance. I don't think we mentioned that. Actually, this one here is just literally a digital in, digital out kit and up to 150 meters over cap. The other models are up to 300 meters over cap. So again, you do get that slightly longer distance on those higher end models. Uh, this is another one if you do need to extend IR. So if your system does require it, again, you've got the ability to send IR signals over a longer distance. As it says, they're up to 250 meters. And you'll see on the transmitter and receiver here, there's an array of input and output IRs. So you can basically add quite a lot of versatility to your infrared over longer distance. Any other key bits there, Kev, or is it just a straight no, they're relatively sounds. straightforward. I mean, I mean, strictly speaking, the uh, the 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 repeater section um, that's got a, 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 the input on it, and that will come out of all five different outputs at the same time. So you can have two locally. So it's quite useful if you want to control a few things in a cupboard that are local to the transmitter, essentially, and you want to control two or three things that are remotely. You can do them both at the same time with this little system. Brilliant. Again, Good it's stuff. just one of the, like we're saying, it's just one of those useful things that actually you just go, oh my God, how am I going to solve that? And I don't think we've got it, but do we do the PU232 in this as well? Dan, I can't remember. I don't think we do actually, no. So there's another one which is a PU232, which is just serial over cat, which is again, it's I think it's 250 meters. And again, they're, we're, they're very, very popular at the moment because people are trying to extend, say, uh, from a I don't know, somewhere in a supermarket or a high, high street store, you used to have all your kit here that does something. The till's got RS-232 out or one of those type of formats output. But now you've got to put that 100 meters away. How are you going to get that data across it? Well, here's a cat cable that was already hit, run through the floor. We can use those. So we've been selling quite a few of those going into retail environments where they need to extend an RS-232 across from one place where it used to be to a new location where they need it all of a sudden wonderful that's really what we're doing today isn't it kev just highlighting some of these little problem solvers that maybe we haven't spoken about that much because yeah they're not quite as glamorous as uh, av over ip systems no, but it's and amazing like how many of them we sell <laughs> exactly they're still very very useful yeah i mean because they're, they're, they're not super common you know there's that's that's the advantage of cyp that's why i've got you know 300 products off not all of them are super sexy not all of them are a high glam but, you know, they're all functional and they all save you sometimes when you need you need a problem solving. Exactly. Yeah. Problem solvers. Exactly right. Uh, this on screen is just another way to control uh, something like an analog amplifier or in fact, uh, yeah, it would be analog. This will take in a digital or analog signal in and then basically you'd be able to feed that out to a um, like an analog amplifier. And this will then yeah. give you the ability to control the volume remotely. That's essentially the, the premise of this one. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, you know, you, you've got a, you've got the ability, obviously, to just send telnet commands to it. So if you've got something within your system that you want to insert into a control system, but it doesn't have any ability to to control the volume, so you've got a, you've got a dumb amp with uh, with with low volume control, like a multi room amp that just hasn't got an individual volume control, and actually you've got this source coming out here, you're running into it, but there's no way of adjusting the, the attenuating, I suppose, to use the posh word, the, the volume uh, into that. Just throw one of these in, some tailneck commands into your control system, build a little slider, and you're away. Super, super, super. There you go, just an example of it, again, in a scenario. So, yeah, very simple to use. And, uh, again, might get people out of a sticky situation. Uh, this one here is just then the ability. We are running a little bit short of time, actually, so we'll, we'll just give this a brief one. But I don't, how did we do that, Kev? We always do know. that now, it's don't we? It's really quickly, isn't it? Just too busy chatting and things like that. Well, we try and make it slightly social, don't we? <laughs> yeah, we're all social distancing, so we'll try and be as social as we can yeah. over, over Zoom. I've only seen you in a little small box for months. 
Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's how I think you look in real life. You're only this big. Um, yeah. So the CR CS2 here. So as it says on the screen, there, effectively giving you access to relay commands, IR, RS232. It's quite a versatile unit, isn't it, Kevin? It can be. Yeah, they're, they're actually system. really, really powerful. It's a, it's a really small box, but they're really powerful. Um, you know, you've got your relay outputs, your IR outputs, your RS232 outputs. Um, and but you've got a lot of uh, a lot of modes here that you can set up. I mean, you've got you can set up macros for triggering and stuff like that. But remember that you can you can send commands into this. So the idea is is this sits somewhere in your system, and you've got the relay out for some blinds or some drop drop screens for projector mounts or whatever. Some IR out for some stuff that you can't control by telnet, but also it will throw out telnet commands. So if it is obviously it's connected to your system. So all the telnet stuff that's in your system can can be programmed here as well. And then you can go to it, look like trigger macro. So it triggers a macro, you know, opens the blinds, turns the TV on, puts it on this channel, fires out an IR command to this box because it doesn't have telnet. So they're really very powerful. I mean, we've actually um, have sold an awful lot of these. Mainly, um, again, it, it's more it's more the commercial space. It's more the um, the commercial environments that these seem to go into um the schools and 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 uh what's the what was the one they did oh it was like a tv production room wasn't it where they were trying to control tv test lab indeed and they yeah, were testing yeah. lots of sources and screens and stuff and they wanted just a, sim a simple device that they could buy a lot of which they did which was nice um uh, that they could just fire out commands and the guy sitting there and they've got uh, they've got an application which is just sends out uh, uh, a mac code you know start macro command to these and it just fires off all these different macro events and they can just set set things up very very quickly they've got a few of these for i get you think they've got one for each four sources or four tvs or something like that um but yeah yeah they're very very popular they can also just have our trigger connected to it so you've got uh our crtg1 trigger which is like a tabletop trigger goes in a tabletop and this this automatically defaults to there's eight buttons on it and it will trigger the first eight macros that you program into the unit so again very very um very versatile very useful excellent uh, and just to note because we are going to look at the rack in a second but the the size you'll see this sort of casing is very familiar across many models we've seen a few of them today as well uh, and it's uh, very popular across other models as well so just bear that in mind when we quickly get to our rack section in a moment Oh, there we go, as if someone had programmed it. So we're now looking at the Rax series. So many of our products, as I say, are of that sort of size. So the model we were just looking at is actually this size here, which we class as a 300 size, Rax 300. And then the bigger items here on the right-hand side are 600, uh, which is basically effectively uh, equivalent to 6U, isn't it? Carefully yeah, that's right. Size. Exactly right. The 600 takes up 6U in a rack, and the 300 takes up 3U in a rack. Perfect, perfect. And these can be used for either CYP products, as you see. So these are our very popular IP7000 transmitters from our AV over IP system. And as you see here, they literally just slot in. Uh, and then you just got the cover here to stop them coming out. But you just slot them in vertically. It will take up to 15 items per rack. Uh, if you've got smaller devices, either CYP devices or third party, you can use the little blanking tray, which we'll yeah. look at in a second. So really yeah, I mean, I've used. Used the, I've used the blanking tray for like small PCs, digital signage players, Apple TVs, anything that I when I'm building a rack for shows or exhibitions, you can just rack tray them in. You, the, the rack trays are all, uh, what you call it, perforated, so you can get cable ties in and around. So, any, you know, anything you want might want to rack up uh, that is in the size that you can get it in there. You just can connect it to a rack tray and, and, and you're away. Exactly right. And the nice thing with this, if you are populating like this, as I say, these are IP, AV over IP transmitters. So you might be pre-configuring these before you go out to site. And in this, you've just literally then take out a pre-configured rack, slot that into the normal 19 inch racking unit and away you go. You do as well then have three different versions of our power manager, depending on the power output. So if you need to power a series of products in this rack unit, rather than having them all with individual PSUs, you can use the rack's power manager, which has things like timed events, uh, so you can have it switching on and off at different times and such like. And you'll see from the back there, it's got multiple outputs on the unit, and then it also has a fan output on each unit. Yeah, it's got dual fan outputs. 
So the Segway fans also quite, there's a couple of things you can do with this. There's four different power managers, 5 volt, 12 volt, 24 volt, and 48 volt. Um, they've got eight ports. The majority of sources you can use all eight ports, um, but do check the wattage of what you're using because sometimes you will um, go over the overall power for the whole unit. So, for, like, for example, if you're using a group of, uh, of our AUA 220 amplifiers because it's an amplifier, and quite a lot of power is used, so I think you can only use five or six of them um in in an eight in an eight uh rack um, but also the, the the fan control is quite good so you have the ability to put the fan um have it on auto and have three temperature settings so the rack unit is also uh measuring the temperature inside your rack and you can have you know, like a low temperature say you know 20 degrees whatever and the rack will turn around slowly and then as it gets hotter at 30 you might want it to get a bit faster and then when it gets to 40 so it's damn hot you put the rack fan on full blast to get it going and this can be automated depending on the temperature they sit inside the back of the rack so in the back of the rack there's two slots for the power managers to go in so each rack can have two in there so if you've got 15 units in there you can power them all from two racks of the relevant size so the rack fans really depending on um whether you're what what the location is of the rack if you're in an air conditioned room uh that's temperature controlled then normally if you've got an open rack frame in your air conditioned room then normally you won't you won't really need that um but if you've got haven't got a, uh, an air conditioned room and you, you're closing a rack up which again can create more heat around it, then we recommend you having a, having a rack fan or two in there just to keep it within in tolerance. Fantastic. Yeah, good stuff. And that's just going to quickly get to the end of its little cycle there. That's not me pressing it manually. It's another uh, improvement, Kev, to my PowerPoint I skills. Know. Aren't I know. they wonderful? Just, do you know you have to press any buttons anymore? <laughs> Uh, there we are. There's the units we mentioned, the racks blanking shelves, which can be used to hold third party equipment or uh, additional equipment of ours. And then you've got the fans as well for the different size of units. Uh, I think we will actually move past this. We've spoken about cabling already. We've already said that cabling is incredibly important in the system and we are a bit over time. So everyone knows about HD base T and the sort of signal it can pass through it. And we just threw in here a last little bit as we're talking about essentials for installs. And that was the recommendations for cat cabling. So as is known sort of market wide, cat five is not recommended for HD base T systems. The recommendation tends to be no. cat five E or higher to make sure that you're going to do basically with a better system better yep. stable signal i mean the, the reality is is if you're laying the cable and you can lay the cable and you know you're keeping it away from power you're keeping it away from 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 ele electronic devices that have uh, have motors like a, a fridge freezer which has a as a as a little motor a little uh that stop pulls in a, a, a surge when it when it kicks off like the compressor of a fridge freezer if you can keep it away from that kind of stuff then then unshielded cable is fine uh, my recommendation is if you're if you're if the system is being uh and the the the, the cabling is ending up going to be put in by someone from non not your company um because they're doing all the cabling in the property and i would just recommend going for a shielded cable because we don't know where they're going to put it for example if an electrician ends up putting your cat cable in he's laying electrical cable where is he going to put it that's right he's going to put it next to his electrical cable because that's what he's doing that's his primary job and he doesn't really know and even if he's been asked he doesn't really know why it should be away from that cable so shoot a cable gonna help a lot <laughs> if you're putting it in Super. you know what you're doing i'm sure you will do you just keep it you know an inch or two away from all electrical cable where you have to where you have to go near electrical crazy just cross it at 90 degrees it can't jump then emi interference has a great difficulty you can get those little clips can't you we've seen have you ever seen those little clips you used to get them at hi-fi shops i can't find them so much anymore but they must be still out there where you can the idea was that you could make sure that your cabling crosses so when you had your audio cabling coming in the back of your amplifier and you had to go past your your, your mains power for the amplifier you could make sure it crossed over like that uh, but that's that's essentially the same type of thing that's that's what we need to do careful with the cat cable super sorry Good i'm going stuff. on about that's all right i know that's we're over time i just can't help myself <laughs> but i could talk for an hour about that chart 
Uh, maybe we should do that as a separate webinar then, I think. So I press the skip button. Um, we, we will just show you this very quickly. Uh, again, thanks for sticking with us. I know we're a couple of minutes over. But we have done actually this sort of problem solving flow diagram, which we'd be more than happy to share with you afterwards, either speak to your distributor or come to us directly. And this is just really, if I have a problem in a system, what might I do to try and establish the problem? Uh, we won't go through it all now, but uh, just again, look at that clever flowing and moving and things. But yeah. it just guides you through try this. If that works, move on to this bit. If that doesn't work, move on to this bit. And you so spent a long this, time, didn't you, Kev, designing this? And yeah, it's almost it. also like a training process for new technicians that might start with us. So, you know, as a as a technician who starts, you're you're going to start doing RMAs. That's the reality. How do you get to know the product? How do you get to understand our product? Well, you look at stuff that's been returned. It's a nice way to do it. But they need to understand the logic of signal path analysis and where the problems go. Where where does it go? So I've tried to create this um, flow chart that basically, and it goes a little bit goes in a circle because you can end up starting again. But it just attempts to help you to follow a process through like some of you will, will be doing this well most of you probably do this all the time you're just following signal and checking at various points along the signal pathway uh, whether the problem is there yet or not and then you can go right well it's i'm halfway through the the cabling of this job and i can't see the problem so i know the problem if it's interference is based in the second half of the cabling infrastructure so it just goes so things like that as well so yeah, perhaps we'll do a uh, perhaps we'll do a whole problem solving one down. I'm not sure, but it, it wouldn't be a stretch to, to get that to run an hour. But we probably need to do a little bit more than just that flow diagram. I'd have to find something else to talk about then, Kev, wouldn't I? Because this this is your this is your <laughs> no, you wheelhouse. Up stealing all my lines anyway is normal. Oh, only afterwards, not on the first time <laughs> round. You know me. <laughs> Anyway, I think that pretty much wraps us up. So again, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we obviously do have all of our products and a lot of information on our website at cypeurope.com. We then have our really nice system solutions guide, which guides you through a whole host of residential and commercial applications and how our products might help in that sort of system. So real life environments and situations and how you might use CYP products to, to kit that system out. So do contact us, that's available to download from the website or we can send you out a hard copy as well. So on behalf of me and Kev, again, thank you very much for joining us. Kev, thanks for running through all of that. Uh, were there any questions during or are we pretty much straightforward today? No, we're, we're all done. That's all Excellent. good. Excellent. Wonderful. No problem. Well, again, thank you for your time. Uh, the next everybody. session, we've got another session in two weeks time, I believe it is. So do keep an eye on the website and your emails for that. And again, thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you all soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Take care.